What you're seeing in the gallery right now are a series of works that came out of my buying a house, along with my husband, Steve, about 25 years ago. I bought a house. And that's, to me, significant because it meant that I, as an African-American woman, had land. I'm going to say that again. I have land. OK? And that's really critical when you look about at the history of African Americans um, in America. This notion of land is critical. Because if you are a landowner, when the forefathers, um, the founding fathers, decided that they were going to create this constitution, they were landowners. The extent to which they were able to have power um, was based on their ability and based on their wealth, which was founded in land ownership. So that's important. So I had land. Um, my parents had land as well. But as a child, I was not um, aware of the significance of that. It was when I bought this house with my husband that I began to think about you know, the fact that here I was, this woman who had this parcel of land now, and what was I going to do with it? And the reason why that question came up is because my mother and her mother were gardeners. And so I was, as a child, brought up around people who valued the land and used the land creatively and also functionally. My uh, grandmother, whose name is Indiana Hudson, there's a piece named for her. Um, my grandmother, she um, had a farm in Pittsburgh um, back in the 40s. And she had a, what we refer to as a victory garden. And that victory garden fed seven children. And also, for the surplus, that she could sell it to her give it to her neighbors. So the, the idea of land itself allowed for community, allowed for um, sustainability, all of those things based on the fact that there was land in the family. So um, her daughter, who also had a garden, um, once again, I didn't pay much attention to it at the time, but I helped her. You know, I, I'd be out there, and I didn't you know, really like, what, what is this, weeds? I don't do weeds. You know, but as I became more aware of it when I had my own land, it became a significant thing. And I began to want to know who else besides me um, in my area. I, I'm working in West Mount area in Philadelphia, kind of nice, um, semi-suburban neighborhood, um, lots of gardens around. But most of the people who are gardening didn't look like me. Some of them did, but not a lot. But being an academia, being curious, being an artist, I needed to know. I needed to know who was out there doing what I was doing with the same kind of passion that I developed, because it did turn into a passion for me. And I wanted to know what the history of African Americans was on the land in this country besides the legacy of slavery. We know what that was about. We were forced onto the land. But then when the emancipation took place, four million people were let loose onto the land. And so I needed to know what that history was when we were making choices about farming and how we would sustain itself and the importance of the land to that sustenance and to our history. So to make a long story a little bit shorter, um, in about two, two, uh, 2012, I decided that I would, along with a friend, drive south and look for 
families who are still on their land. Because that's important, still on their land. Because the, the history of African Americans after emancipation on the land was one of concerted efforts by their neighbors and, of course, the government to get us off our land, to deny us that power that is inherent in land ownership. So I went looking for what I refer to as legacy farms, farms that had been in families over multiple generations meaning they had managed to hold on to their land um, during Jim Crow, during all of the different efforts that um, basically uh, diminished our land ownership. Right now, in terms of statistics, maybe about 2% of all farms in this country are owned by people of color. At the turn of the century, of the 20th century, there were about um, 20 million acres that were in black, the hands of black farmers. And over time, the attrition of Jim Crow, um, the Great Migration, all of these things reduced the numbers on the land itself. So the fact that there would be still farmers on the land continuously with their families, I saw these people as heroes. Because my thought is, how did you put up with that crap and stay on your land? And you know, who are these people? So um, I came across a book by, written by a scholar of, well, he, he's horticultural um, science from the University of South Carolina, Richard, Richard Westmacott. And he did a book called African American Farms and Yards in the Rural South. And he looked at about 42 farms. Um, and he looked at it from an anthropological point of view. And he created these maps, amazing maps with a lot of detail that showed where animals were kept, where the houses were, what kind of gardens they had, and they were kind of beautiful graphic maps that um, introduced me to the existence of these folks. I had names. That's really what's important. You know, when you're talking about heroes, you need some names. You know, you need people that you can identify um, as these people have been on their land since this, and they're doing this, and they're passing it on. And I thought that it was incredibly important to make work and name the names. OK, so that was the first body of work that I did around that. And then I did another body of work. Oh, that first body was called Places of Our Own. And that was kind of put a signature on that. And then I did another body of work called More Places of Our Own with more names. And so that has been kind of a signature part of this. Now, making all that work over the last 10, 15 years now, um, some things have um, kind of broken off into little tangents because I'm looking even closer at the work that I was doing and identifying things with more specificity. So when you're looking at this work, you're starting to see things that are identifiable. You see houses, you see eggs, um, you see birds, you see all kinds of things that you can identify with. Because now, um, on my trip south, I was able to take a lot of photographs, do um, a lot of interviews, and get really closer to those folks. Now, I couldn't get really close to them because I would make an appointment. And we were driving, me and my friend Helen Ramsarhan, who's a sculptor up in New York. Um, we had appointments. And we could show up at these farms. But these folks are working hard. And they don't have time for folks like me 
coming down there, taking up time. So we would go in, photograph, wander the farm. Um, I would uh, conduct interviews. All of that allowed me to collect firsthand um, information, you know, on the spot information, which was different than looking at Wes McCott's book of maps and reading. So this put me closer to these folks, get a sense of the spaces, and also most important as an artist is to see objects in context and to make some kind of physical and often emotional connection to looking at this stuff. So walking on this land, in Georgia the land was red, and so that, that also might explain the colors in this room is because of that earth and the title of this show, Earth Offerings. So, you know, just that experience was really, really um, something that is totally resonant and continues to be so years later um, because I, uh, I had another show of this work at the African American Museum in Philadelphia. And some of those folks came up from the South and brought the food. And you know, it just kind of made my heart beat, you know, making that connection. And it was such an important thing for them. And also the issue of anonymity. Here they are. These are not statistics. These are the people who are doing this, living these lives, and provoking me as an artist to respond to their experience, which is the key to this, is a response, an acknowledgement of this history, which is an obscured history. Who in this room has read anything, seen anything, heard anybody talk about the history of African Americans on the land other than the boilerplate stuff that you get about us coming to grow indigo, cotton, and rice. Okay, so here we have stewards of the land. And so this exhibition is about that. So um, I'll go through and just talk about some objects. The one, um, oh, I should also talk about the other thread that's in here. One of the things that I saw repeatedly was the fact that everyone was hanging their clothes out. No washer dryers. You know, they had land and they'd string a rope and they would put up clothes on the clothes pin, with a clothes pin. And I fortunately still have the bag of clothes pins that my mother, Ernestine Carpenter, an amazing gardener, that she used to hang my clothes up. So I still have those as an artifact. And they have become somewhat sacred to me because they represent her. They are the embodiment of her. So whenever you see this old-fashioned clothespin made out of wood, in this case, they're made out of clay, um, that's her. That's Ernestine. And she is showing up in different guises, many of them mythical. So here is a piece that's called Mother Pin, and I call this series the Mother Pin series. Mother Pin a fire because she could. She was strong, fiery, beautiful, elegant. This is Mother Pin arise. She had difficulties, but she rose. She provided her. Even though there were things that would hold her down, she rose above it. Um, this, there are three mother pins on a vine because she was a gardener. These are um, real lentil beans. This is real food on here. This is not clay. So it speaks to her ability to provide um, and being able to lay each one of those beans on there one at a time made me 
It was kind of a restorative process. I will confess that my husband Steve did help <laughs> lay some on there. But, you know, the whole ritualistic thing of laying on the lentils was um, something that made this piece that more important to me. So here she is as fruit on the vine. Also, when you see this wheel in my work, I don't think it shows up too many more times in here. Um, that wheel represents her halo, but at the same time, it represents her being the leader. Because in this country, when we want to use a phrase to talk about who's in control, what do we say? Who's at the wheel? Okay, so that wheel becomes really an important emblem for the work. So here she is spiritually, but also practically showing up in, in this form. Um, so that's mother pin on a vine. And I should also go back to this one. Um, this is called Ramshackle Fence. And it is one of the earliest pieces in the series. And it basically has just about all the components of a lot of these pieces in it. It's a compendium, basically. And I call it a ramshackle fence, because um, that word ramshackle has a certain kind of rhythm and texture to it that I like. I like ramshackle. And, the, and also the fact that that's what I saw on many of the farms, because it was about this um, sense of being resourceful and using everything. So a fence, you didn't go to Home Depot and get some wired up stuff from them. You found what you found, and you made your fence. And those fences, to me, were quite beautiful, you know, just the way they rambled. But also, a fence itself covers distance. And distance represents time. So that, to me, is history, legacy. So the idea of a fence itself is emblematic as time and history. The bottles are representing people. There's the house. Um, you know, the bound body bottle itself. I do have a piece in which my mother appears as a bound bottle as well. So it's all in there. Um, this trash can, all of these things, you know, here's the beginnings of the mother pins are showing up, the clothing on the line, all of these things, and it's jostling. Now, I like words. So something that jostles or rambles and floats and shifts, that's really an important part of me making, because lots of verbs in my head. Um, I like work that moves. I like work that, um, even if it's standing still, and clay, for the most part, if you want to be safe, should stand still. You don't want it moving around. But you can imply that it moves around. So most of what I do doesn't have flat bottoms. There's some flat bottoms in this show, some of the Bowls have flat bottoms. But I tend to make sculptures that suggest they're going to move. Um, because it's about time. It's about history. It's about this kind of tenuous, tentative um, experience that we all have here on the land. And that's the one of the things that I want to emphasize in the work is I know that it's all tentative. I know that it's precarious. All the more reason for honoring these farmers and gardeners, because their grip, they got a grip on this. And what I'm really happy about now is that there are so many um, African Americans who are at the forefront and at the vanguard of urban gardening now. Because when they left during the um, Great Migration, the idea was to get away from the dirt, get away from the 
insult of the dirt. But did they forget how valuable it was to them? No. When they came, they established community gardens. Um, like my grandmother, they started their gardens for, during the war, the victory gardens. So all of that information and knowledge still is bubbling up, percolating, and becoming such an essential component of what we now see as this new urban push to bring farming and garden, gardening into our lives. So that has been, to me, the, you know, one of the most exciting things about that. You know, in Philadelphia, New Jersey, there are just all these farms that people are using. And now the idea of it being a lower aspiration has now been turned on its head. To be a farmer now has a certain level of distinction to me. Once again, you know, it, the importance of that and the power that that brings to um, our culture right now. And I like to use the word culture around it because agriculture, we don't think about it in those terms. We think of it as farmers. Um, you know, there, there's no uh, intellect behind it. There's no creativity behind it. And I would say absolutely not. Because these are folks who have a connection to the earth, knowledge, and they will be our saviors, believe it or not. So all of you who are gardening, I say carry on. And um, I'll end with that. Oh. <laughs>